Hello and welcome to a new episode of The Other Russian. And today I'm going to be short. I'm on a business trip in India and I've been quite busy for the past week and a half trying to establish some business connections between Russian businesses and Indian businesses. One thing I want to share with you is that the sentiment between our countries in terms of relationship and the deep connection over the course of at least last century is very different. It is positive. First of all, in India nobody gives a shit about the color of my passport, being Russian. However, uh, there are different nuances to it and of course I'm not talking about the bad aspects, I'm talking about the local nuances of doing business in India. And I can share some insights further on if you want me. Put it in the comments, I'll get back to you on that. I'll have a lot of information to share. So before, you know, proceeding with my day, I have a call that I need to catch in like 40 minutes or so. So, but one thing about marketing that amazed me earlier today, and if you've watched this podcast before, you may have noticed that I talk about a lot of different topics. And today I'm not going to be talking about psychedelics a lot because it is a separate podcast that I'm trying to do uh, on, you know, from time to time. But anyway, I uh, put a lot on my plate and still somehow continue doing that type of stuff. But talking about India and the general perspectives of doing business here, India's got a lot of potential. India's got a lot of plans. And just to give you an understanding of what type of ambitions I'm talking about here, so currently it's 2023 and India plans to be 100% electric vehicle operational by 2030. All right, let that sink. In seven years, I don't know what is penetration right now. I have a feeling that it's roughly maybe 15 to 20%. I'm not sure about that. But anyway, uh, there's a lot of ground to cover. However, India has this potential to make it happen and this is the most surprising part, at least to me, because if you've never been to India, you wouldn't believe it until you see it. Because when you come to India, it is very different from the Western world. And, you know, I've had an experience of engaging with Russian businessmen, owners and big type of management position people, like C-suite basically from uh, medium-sized businesses in Russia. So there was a delegation that came with it. They came from Russia, I came from Lithuania, and uh, you know, we, it was an interesting experience. Of course, people are uh, like, you know, more experienced, um, definitely more rich, <laughs> more filthy rich than me. But for them, it was a big cultural shock, of course. So for me, India is Currently, it's my eighth time visiting India, and I love this country. So the first time I visited India was 12 years ago when I went for a 10-day Vipassana meditation taught by Goenka. And yeah, of course, it was a cultural shock, uh, but yeah, it was 12 years ago. So over the years, I've been visiting the country, and um, I don't know if you hear, like, noises. I'm recording this at the Airbnb, and probably the setup is not perfect here. So I hope you won't suffer that much. But anyway, going back to India, I have a sweet spot in my heart for India because I love the country, I love people. Mm-hmm. Food is amazing, but yeah, not for each taste, I'd say. Yeah, just to give you an idea, a few people from the delegation that I came with, they were eating only plain steamed rice because it was hard for them to digest and uh, they consider India's uh, food, Indian foods as spicy. For me it's not that spicy because I remember going to Thailand less than a year ago and asking to make a Thai spicy tom yum. It took me a while to digest it. I wasn't prepared to do it right away. I gradually built my resilience towards spiciness, but still, Indian food is not that spicy for me. However, I bet there are places where you can find really Indian proper proper spicy food. So yeah, going back to things I love about India, it's not only cuisine, it's also about the nature. And it is very different, very diverse. So you may have heard from me, and one of the episodes I did show you some photos from Himalayan region, which is Jammu and Kashmir, if I remember correctly. So India has, I'm afraid I can make a mistake here, but 35 states. 
So within each state, uh, there is a different kind of region, basically, of geography, and it has different nuances, like take Goa. I mean, this is a really interesting state, and, you know, a lot of people know Goa, especially in the United States, and, uh, you know, so-called hippies know <laughs> about that. So they went to go in the 60s, and there are still communes there living um, from, you know, people who relocated from not only USA, but other European countries in Russia as well. And there are places and beaches which are considered Russian, like Arambol. It's the upper north of Goa. If I remember correctly, it's like the farthest beach to the north. So yeah, I mean, I guess those Russians, they like north. <laughs> Whereas south is very different. And typically people from Europe go to south and there is a strict division. So basically there are two parts of it, north and south, and in between them there's a separation. There, This is... I don't remember the place, uh, but they have an airport, so yeah, I mean, it divides and there's a narrow road that separates the south and north of Goa. So yeah, going back to India and uh, the trip, the things that I wanted to share with you is that I've spent a lot of time visiting different like institutions and in terms of providing higher education and spoke with local entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, uh, business people, government people from both Russian side and Indian side. And there's so much warmth towards us as Russians, which is totally insane because I completely forgot about that. You know, living in Lithuania, I've never faced any kind of, well, per se, discrimination. Nobody told me anything about me being Russian, but there were cases where, you know, the general kind of tension was in the air. I remember going to see your apartment, you know, to rent it further. And the owners asked uh, myself and uh, my spouse if we we're from Russia. And we said, yeah. And uh, then they asked, what is our position in terms of war? And prior to that, I told them that I left the country in March 2022. So for me, if you're a decent human being with uh, some common sense in, in there, it kind of conveys the message, right? So the war started in February 2022 and I left the country in, well, actually I left it in, in February, but yeah, as of March, I was living in Lithuania. So still, I mean, there is this sentiment there and of course it is politically driven and one can say that people in the EU are indoctrinated, but then again, the double-faced nature of human beings is that you know, when it's easy, while it's easy to talk about somebody else being different, it is easy to not notice something of that hypocritical nature of human beings within ourselves. So just to give you an idea, um, well, still people who came from Russia, they don't call war by its name, they call it special military operation. There are several reasons and aspects to it. So first of all, is that it is prohibited by law to call war by its name, war. You can face jail time. And it is weird, it is strange. So, you know, one can also say that Russian people are indoctrinated. But anyway, going back to India and the dyes that I've been building here, some of the insights just to, you know, <laughs> give you an understanding of what I'm talking about and can. If you put it in the comments, I'll get back to you, maybe make an episode about uh, specifically building business in India. So one of the aspects is that it takes time. It takes physical presence and it takes connections. So those three key aspects are critical. And you know, you can apply this to a, each and every new market. But I bet there are nuances to India, because uh, if you we're talking from cultural or religious perspective, then you can notice that why people are not in a rush, because there is another life, right? So there is reincarnation, the concept of it. And if you don't do something in this life, you can do it in a different life. So yeah, I went to the Museum of Modern Art and uh, Photography uh, yesterday in Bangalore, in, uh, in India. And, you know, it was really interesting to see the, the paintings, the mythology of it, the, 
aspects of which I'm talking about right now, like reincarnation. So, you know, Rama was dissatisfied with some dude and, you know, made him kind of go... Oh, actually, it was either Shiva or somebody else. But yeah, anyway. <clears throat> so, basically, one told the other that you need to kind of do a lot of, lot, of, lot of cycles, like circles within the... I don't know what's it called, Sanskara or whatever. And only then, after gaining enough wisdom, you can then re be reborn as a human being. So it's an interesting concept, but I guess what I'm saying here is that it is culturally deep-rooted in the way people communicate, engage the business, conduct business as well. So it's an interesting topic. Well, another thing is that I went to an event called Tech Summit. It is similar, well, a kind of similar to a web summit that is happening in Portugal uh, on a yearly basis. It's a massive event. A lot of big businesses go there, spend shitload of money to make a really nice looking exhibition stand and, you know, gain some traction, contracts, contacts as well. So they say that tech summit is the biggest IT industry event in Southeast Asia. And that could be true. And even though I haven't been to Web Summit, I've seen some of the exhibition stands there because I co-own uh, an interior design agency or studio called Brand Expand, and my partner there is ex digital head of digital at Sber, which is the biggest IT conglomerate and I don't know what well, ecosystem. Nowadays they call it ecosystem. So yeah, he as well left the country, no longer resides there. And uh, we decided to, you know, partner up. But he was making a stand for his bear at the summit, web summit, uh, in 2021. And you know, they said the organizers there was the best uh, exhibition stand booth out there. Well, it's not a booth actually; it's a stand. It was massive, but yeah, very detailed and thought through. So going back to the tech summit, I went to the exhibition part and the conference part, and they differ a lot. So. There is this like huge gap between people who have exhibition booths at Tech Summit and people who speak at the conference. And it's kind of behind the paywall. So it is free of charge to go to the exhibition and see the stands and you know browse around and meet people and find some interesting businesses out there. But if you want to go to the conference, all the halls are only for paid visitors. And it's nice, I mean, you can get a lot of context there if you know how to mingle and establish new connections and prospect and stuff like that. But if you look at the exhibition stands, they're quite basic. Not only in terms of design, I'm not talking about it. Because you can understand that exhibitions seems in India, I mean, I'm judging only by the biggest tech event in Southeast Asia. Still, they look very basic, right? And um, it, it, it is really strange because theoretically exhibition stand can bring you a lot of business, a lot of contacts, a lot of prospects and, you know, help you proceed and progress further. But yeah, not only the design is basic, the messaging, it killed me, like, I. I don't know, browsed around 100 roughly of those exhibition stands at Tech Summit in Mangalore. And the things that I noticed is that, first of all, people lack clarity. Like, seriously, you go to a stand and they have, you know, all those branded walls and some words written there. And those words, they do not convey the meaning. So you go there and you see people writing, you know, AI, technology, system, I don't know, whatever, just some buzzwords. But it takes you like several minutes to stand there and try to figure out what exactly the fuck are they doing. <laughs> this is insane. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't really get it. This is so basic. I mean, in terms of ideas, so you're purchasing an exhibition stand. Why wouldn't you make sure that you convey a message that you kind of help your potential partners or target audience 
understand easy enough what exactly are you doing. And this is like basic marketing, all right? Like zero, zero, zero point one. So there was no clarity. The second thing that amazed me is that, you know, some people put values, mission, vision on their walls at, of their exhibition booths. And you read it and you're like, yeah, but there is hundred or a thousand of companies like yours and they have exactly the same words written as a vision or mission or, you know, values. Why do I give a shit? Right? So I don't know why, but I just wanted to share those insights because if you're planning to do any business in India, you need to understand that it is important to be crystal clear in terms of the messaging that you do, in terms of what exactly are you conveying, who is your audience, and what are you trying to achieve? Like, what's the takeout in your messaging, in your texts, and everything? Because the lack of clarity is something that is like a red line going through all businesses in India. And why am I saying this? Because I've been spending a lot of time throughout this year to try and establish business connections, get attraction going and, you know, find some prospect clients or people interested to work with us. And I've seen hundreds and hundreds of websites and I connect with people through LinkedIn. And typically, you know, there are C-suite type of people, like, you know, different general managers, VPs, chief marketing officers, that type of people. And I went to their profiles and, you know, went to their websites. And the websites that I browsed, pretty much same in terms of what I told you before about the exhibition booths. They lack clarity and they lack, like, something unique to them. Because again, I mean, in some websites you go and you just read it through and you don't have a clue what they're doing. <laughs> because there are cases, of course, not all the time, but still when there is a business and they do everything, like literally everything, what you can think of. And it is confusing because it's hard to understand what exactly are they doing. And the second thing is, again, if you read their mission, vision, values, whatever they put there, it's all the same. I mean, you can just take one logo, replace it with another, and it's gonna be the same. And what people don't yet understand in India is, in terms of marketing at least, and it's not that I'm that, you know, Gora who is teaching people something, it's just, I've noticed that the type of work that we do at Fanatic, it's a strategic marketing consultancy that's still run, is, we, have, we build strategies and we build brand strategies and then we help companies implement that across their entire business and basically build the entire business around brand. But the thing that I've noticed is that the level of expertise and knowledge of marketing discipline in Russia is very basic. But Indian market is lagging like a decade behind, which for me gives more knowledge and understanding and kind of expertise that is slightly more advanced than average in India. Let's put it this way so that I don't offend anybody. But yeah, the idea here is that people in India don't yet use marketing to its full potential. So yeah, I mean, that's really interesting observation, at least to me, because you know, I'm a marketer and uh, I look at the situation from a bit uh, professional, deformed position, if you can call it this way. So, yeah, in case you ever plan to do business in India, make sure to allocate a lot of time, make sure to build connections, and uh, shit, what else? Yeah, be present here, physically, because one other thing that I've noticed is that it's my third visit in India this year and only when I come here, only when I'm physically present, there is some traction. There are some meetings, there's something happening, 
once I'm here. I can meet people, of course, and you know, they can introduce me to somebody else, which is great. But it seems that it's not that possible to do remotely. And I'm a person who's been spoiled with remote work, so I run my businesses 100% remotely. And I do know that it is possible because we're doing it. However, I thought that after COVID, things changed across the world, and they did, in a sense. But there are businesses that are still 100% kind of connected to the physical world, and without this connection, it is not possible to progress further. That's why I'm saying physical presence is important here. And it could be somebody else that you trust, maybe an employee of yours, maybe somebody else, but without physical presence, it's just simply not possible. Well, at least so far, it seems. But yeah, so today I think I'm gonna wrap up this one because I haven't been recording in a while and I think it's, it's time to do so. So because of me being busy, I wasn't dedicating enough time to my blogging and understand that Google algorithms don't like it. So I need to record something and put out there. This is exactly what I'm doing. I will try to record more, but I do need your feedback. So please make sure to go to the comments, leave your feedback. If you like it, like it. If you decide that somebody should see or hear this, just send them over, share, subscribe, and yeah, contribute. Because I have some information that I'm willing to share with you, but that depends on what type of like specific topics you're interested in. That's where you come in. But I will still continue recording a separate podcast dedicated to psychedelics. So thank you for watching and I need to go prepare for my meeting. Thank you very much and until next time.